I'm Justin Hill. My title is a prototype R&D machinist. I am Trevor Knopp, and I'm also a prototype R&D machinist. I, and I'm also machinist of the year. Where are you at? Sorry. Coolest part to watch from start to finish. Can it be prototype stuff? It, I think it's gotta be. Yeah, the bolt gun, so currently. Yeah. Bolt gun definitely is the coolest part to watch from start to finish. 100%. Because of the processes we have to use to make it, um, the, we, we finish machine it on a five axis machine and it's definitely the funnest one to watch and probably the most difficult as far as holding tolerance and doing all of the process we have to do to it because it's not one operation. That, it's a loaded so how, question. So how many machines do we run at once? Uh, it, it depends on the day. Yeah. Like, we could be running three machines in one day. We could be running one single machine for a week. It kind of just depends for R&D stuff. Um, typically, our operators run two to three machines-ish. We Our process is generally, if it's not R&D, if it's production, we'll set a machine up for production. And then we once we get that through the QC and buy-off procedure, uh, that will go to now an operator. So an operator on each shift will run that machine. If those machines have issues, we'll look at those. Um, and then for the R&D side, like Justin said, it's either we're working on the same part for two weeks or we're working on multiple different machines in the same day. How many machines do we have total? Like a, like a hundred? I think we have we're, hundred yeah, over a hundred spindles. We're getting close to a hundred spindles. Yeah. Just the, the whole process of machining is super enjoyable. Um, you're taking something from nothing, a block of metal, a forging, and you're turning it into a functional piece of, of art, pretty much, in my eyes. Machining is one of those things where it's like, it's supposed to be numbers, and it's supposed to, everything's supposed to make sense, and nothing ever does. So it's like the troubleshooting process and making everything function properly and work how it's supposed to. Um, the machine we use for receivers are horizontals and we machine our rails on a vertical. But without going into too much detail, yeah, that the we have a lot of Mazax and Okumas and everything receiver wise is ran on a horizontal, like Justin said, and everything the uh, handguards wise is ran on a vertical for the important operations. I really can't explain that any more than that. Nope. Yeah, that, that's, a tough, that's a tough question because it kind of depends on if you want it to work or not. Because the most affordable way is to, to design it in, in some type of CAD and then 3D print it. That's the most affordable way to see your actual part in real time. But to make it actually function and out of metal or whatever material that you, de you, de you de uh, designed it around, um, that, I mean, it kind of depends. Yeah, you can 3D print it and make it look like the picture, but if you actually want it done, it's gonna go through a whole R&D process, and there's no affordable way to do R&D. Like, that's the most expensive, probably part of this whole company is research and development. Yeah, you could. It's it yeah, it just goes back to the affordability thing. Like it anything machine related is expensive. Like even one cutter you're looking at $150 for. And if you're and that's for on the cheaper end. So if you're looking at some of these machines behind us, we got, you know, 80 to 150 tools in them. And then you got the holder cost and you could definitely do it in your garage, but it'd be very small scale and it would still be expensive. Both. Both, but I mean, realistically, do you still use a grandfather clock in your house? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you mostly digital. Mostly everything's going digital, but everyone's gonna have both in their toolbox. So, uh, 
digi digital micrometers and calipers, basically there's an, a little LCD readout on it and that's what tells you what size your part actually is. And with dial micrometers and uh, calipers, you pretty much have a, a needle that tells you your final size. So there's a scale on the actual um, caliper that tells you like what hundred thou range you're in. And then the dial will tell you the actual down to the thousandth size, usually. So, I mean, there's some tighter tolerance ones and stuff like that, but your, your uh, typical calipers you're gonna see are gonna give you to a thou reading. If they've never been dropped. Yeah, if they've never been dropped, for sure. <laughs> What's oh. the most in bores? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we hold super tight tolerance on our bores. There's true position callouts to a lot of the datums on our parts, which ensure that the receivers are gonna go together and function. Yeah. Um, honestly, my favorite part of metrology would be um, CMMs, but as one of our best machinists would say, we haven't been back to the moon since CMMs were invented. <laughs> so I don't even check my parts; they're just good off the machine. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't need them. <laughs> it's a coordinate measuring machine. Machine. Yeah. It's basically a, a CNC machine for checking the part. Yeah. So instead of cutting the part, they're measuring the part on it. They use a lot of manual tools in our QC uh, department as well, but the CMM is, especially on production stuff, I know they go through and they check parts on each machine every day. So a certain part's getting taken off, a batch of parts getting taken off of each machine, ran through the CMM and then back out there. So it's pretty similar to actually running the machine. Oh, you want me to answer that? Yeah, I've started every one. Okay, really? I think so. All right. Uh, and guards are made not from billet, so a piece of billet would be a solid piece of material, no matter what the material is. It's made from an extrusion. Uh, the extrusion process is basically they take a solid rod of aluminum, because that's what the handguards are made out of, and they push it through some dyes, and that makes the rough form of what we want on the handguard. And then we get those in a certain length. I don't, I don't, we can't give a ton of information away, obviously, but we get those pieces of extrusion in a certain length that goes through a saw cut process then that goes to another machine uh, where it gets the first stop established on it where is where the bore where it's going to meet to the upper or the barrel nut uh, and then it goes to a vertical machine where it cuts all of the m lock slots and lightning pockets and rail and everything on the part that way <laughs> when you like to know <laughs> That's not really something that we can give out information on. Um, the cycle times that we do have are fast. I yeah. can tell you that. Lightning fast. So this is also a question that we can't answer completely. Um, but what we can say is that we use technology in every aspect of our machining process. And that's probably what sets us apart the most from other manufacturers. Part, part quantity, like again, like I feel like that's the last fucking question. We can't go super in depth to it, but the more parts you can, in theory, make at once, and the uh, technology and like cutter technology has come so far, especially in the last 10, 15 years. So processes that we've had 20 years ago, when we're still using the same process now, but we can able to run everything faster, and then. Uh, programming softwares have gotten so much better to where we're able to reduce uh, time just based on it coming out of, from the programming into the machine. Uh, we're able to, just the way we're able to control each part uh, and we're able to control the process of how we're cutting, when we're cutting multiple parts at once, uh, is able to make it faster that way. Um, the most difficult part customers <laughs> for the design for the design aspect of it yeah I, I mean honestly I would say probably probably the upper receivers just yeah. because they have the most like it's like the most important guts of the gun yeah as far as tolerances and stuff like that the lower receivers have a few things that we have to really hold um, but 
upper receivers just take more work to make. The, the bores have to be good to the rail, the rail has to be good to the mating surface of the barrel. Uh, if all of that stuff doesn't work out together, then we're not making a good part. And, and the end user would be a direct reflection of that. The coolest machine on our floor? The one I mean, closest to the bay door? <laughs> Uh, I mean, that kind of depends on who you're asking because, like, all of them do different stuff. Like, I really like multi-axis machines, and um, another guy could really like the EDM. I mean, you're using an electric bandsaw. It's pretty cool. Electric bandsaw? Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I know. That varies. Like, I'm a big mill guy. Justin's kind of done it all. We have guys that are very lathe-focused. and you're gonna get a different answer from all those guys. I'm like, I like big machines and big parts, and Justin does a lot of the multi-axis stuff, so, which, I mean, multi-axis stuff is really cool. Yeah, so it's kind of, I mean. Yeah, personal preference, I would say. Yeah, but. definitely personal preference. Certified? Yeah. Are Cert any of us certified? I'm, I'm technically, I'm certified. Oh, technically you yeah, are certified. Technically. I have uh, a degree. Yeah, that's, that's certified. That's certified? Yeah. Okay, so. We are certified. Mainly, uh, you're going to need to get a job in the industry and you're going to have to work and put some hours in and then a lot of shops will have either apprenticeship programs or you can go to like a tech school and uh, go through like a four year, two year, whatever it is at that particular school and then you're a certified machinist coming out but there's still a lot to be learned on the actual shop floor. You know, nothing replaces uh, on-the-job training in this in this industry. No, like that, like Justin said, there's basically you have two avenues: find your way in a machine shop. Doesn't matter what you're doing, find a, find a, some job, some position in a machine shop. Try to get into an apprenticeship program if they have that available, uh, and then work your way up from there. Um, the route I took was I went to tech school for two years and then came out and I did the same thing: took a basic job, in a, which was actually Arrow took a basic job straight out of college here and then worked my way up uh, from loading machines to what I'm doing now. Yeah, we, we have an apprenticeship program that we work directly with. Um, and it, it takes time to get into. I mean, you've got to come in and put the work in and show the aptitude and drive to want to be something more than just having a job and then it's it's really like based on how well you work for your manager and the, the job that you do and then you can get into the apprenticeship program that's an application process right yeah and so we just ha we have an application period every quarter I believe and you fill out an application we go through do interviews stuff like that and then uh, select people to go into the apprenticeship program. Um, no. Yeah, I'm, as far as like guns go, I don't think it's gonna be a benefit anything, but I know that in the aerospace industry, lithium aluminum has become bigger and bigger over the last probably like five to eight years. Um, Boeing started using it on a bunch of their planes and it seems to be a, when, when all that aluminum's adding up to a huge weight like an airplane, I could see how it could really help out. I really don't know it's because I haven't, seen, I, haven't seen, I haven't been here for all the revs on the lower receivers. No. Um, I'll be here five years in July and I know that nothing has really changed as far as like adjustments to the tolerances. Um, they are always are what they are and we have to hit those. A lot of with the AR stuff, it's a lot of mil spec stuff, yeah. which Mill spec is kind of an interesting term, uh, especially when it comes to the dimensioning side of all the parts, but the, there's some stuff that we've tightened up quite a bit from what a mill spec would say, and then kind of changed how they tolerance it. So instead of having plus or minus on something, we'll have all plus tolerance or all minus tolerance and shrink the tolerance range based on that because it works better I don't want to say competitors parts, but like, especially like the trigger pocket on the lower, that's one of the things that we hold to a tighter tolerance. Um, 
just so it works better with drop-in triggers and stuff like that. But I mean, that, a question like that is going to be more directed towards QC and engineering than yeah. us. We call that pride tolerance. Yeah. Because, I mean, a lot of the time it's wide open for a lot of the features. Right. And we hold them way tighter than what they're supposed to be. Yep. Work hard. Grow some tough skin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, grow I mean, tough skin. And yeah. if you see a guy that makes more money than you sweeping a floor, go sweep the floor. Yeah, you should probably do, be doing the stuff that he's doing. Right. Most um, guys in our industry will do anything you ask them to do. They don't have a problem with it. You'll see us driving around on forklifts, dumping chip bins and stuff like that, mopping up floors if we have a coolant spill. And if you're new and you want to go somewhere in the career, making yourself noticed in a good way of taking the bull by the horns. And when we're cleaning something up by a machine, if you're not busy and you're over there helping, and then drive and the want to learn is way more important than like your actual talent. You can come into a machine shop with all the talent in the world. If no one wants to work with you, you're not going to go anywhere. So attitude. You'll never know everything. Yeah. So you can't act like you do. There's always something that you can't do. There's always something that somebody's going to be better than you at. Yep. It's just, it's just the name of the game because some people are specialized. I mean, you might know something they don't, but they're going to know a lot more that you don't. And it's just, yeah. it's You'll just be, how it works. You could be struggling with an issue on a machine and then fight it for hours to go ask your colleague and he figures it out in 35 seconds and then that's where the fix team comes in because you're not going to stop hearing about that for the next like six months. Yeah. But, you know, it's all for the greater good. Uh, it, it really depends, but most, most, of our, most of our operations will last for thousands of parts before they have to be changed. Yeah. I would say 90%. Yeah, we have some cutters that a lot of machining, they base cutter life off of time, so not necessarily off of parts, uh, to where we have cutters that last 1,000 minutes to 3,500 minutes, and how many parts it cuts. Well, you, if you don't know a lot about machining, to make one lower takes a lot of cutting tools. It's not just one tool doing everything, right? So those, those cutters can be cutting that part from anywhere from, you know, five minutes of the program to literally seven seconds of the program. Like the, so yeah, I mean a cutter that's running seven seconds is gonna last months and thousands and thousands of parts. A cutter that's running for five minutes in there is gonna get changed much more often and you know, 1,500, 2,000 parts, something like that probably. Is it better? 7075 is, takes higher pressures. So like when you're looking at something like an upper, like the, the pressure that the part's seeing, 7075 is better for. It's also heat treated. It's better resistant for like dents and dings and stuff like that too. So if you drop your stuff, like, it's, and it's better dimensionally when you're actually cutting it too. It's marginal compared to 6061, but it's just a better material. Yeah. Especially for the cost. Yeah, it, it just doesn't move around as much. Um, 6061 cuts like butter. Um, so does 7075, and so it's like you're gonna choose whatever one is just better. Metallurgic, metallurgically, if that's a word, is that metal, a word? Metal. Metallurgically. Yeah, let's go with it. They'll tell us if it's yeah, not. It's got to be a word. <laughs> got to be a word. Anyway, uh, it's it's really comes down to like nerdy science when it comes to making the forgings on why it's better or not better. Forge parts are stronger than billet. Yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> I so opened up it's a can of worms. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> a, it's the same thing. So tensile strength, uh, grain direction, all that stuff matters when you're using billet. With forge... Uh, when you cut a billet part, the grain structure is all running the same direction. When you cut a forge part, they literally take a rod and they smash it into the shape of the forging. Yeah. When you do that, the grain structure in that part is not going every which direction. So when you cut parts with a grain structure that has like a, lumen, like a piece of billet aluminum has a grain structure to it, either A, if you cut it the wrong way, it's gonna be very weak. If you cut it the correct direction, everything's still running the, the, same, the same way. So if you took a board, you can snap it really easy the way that the grain's running. If you try to snap it across the grain, 
gonna be very difficult. Aluminum and metals is the same way. And if you were to take that board and shove it all together and then try to break it after that, it's kind of the same thing. Anytime you're changing that grain structure, that gr the grain structure in the part changes drastically, uh, you're gonna get more strength out of it. And you go through a secondary compression with the part. So instead of just being a piece of billet coming off of a saw, it's coming out of a forging where it just got smashed into a part. It also comes down to cost. Yeah. Typically you're going to have more operations with billet parts. Yep. Just because you have to actually machine a profile on it rather than having your profile already forged into the part. And so you have to grab it more times and like we talked about earlier, um, the amount of operations and how long they take is everything when it comes to cost. And typically you can get sexier lines with a forge part over a billet part. Billet parts can look really, really cool if they're done in a cool way, but uh, you can get a lot of the things that are difficult to cut on the part, you can forge into the part and it's going to save cost drastically and be stronger. My cup's been empty for a while. Mine's empty. Should yeah, we I just, set these down? I just keep sipping on it. I feel like we should set should them down. Should we switch yeah, sides? Yeah, let's switch sides. How do we broach a magwell? Is that public knowledge? I don't know. They're right over there. You can't, I point like you can see them. <laughs> There's uh, a, it's a pole broach. It's like a draw style broach. Yep. So we machine the magwell to a very specific dimension. The width of the, uh, Magwell is hold uh, plus or minus two, and then the length is a little bit more open, and the pull broach literally drops into the magwell. Uh, there is a hydraulic ram that grabs onto the broach and then draws the whole, uh, what are they, probably six foot? Yeah, like about six, six foot feet. long broach bar through it, and that's what establishes uh, the corners and the sides and the uh, important features of the magwell. Basically, it gradually works its way down, and so it's smaller on the bottom in that same shape and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it pulls it all the way through. <laughs> so a lot of hand work, so they actually use hand tools, uh, 90 motors, uh, they use straight motors, they use a bunch of stuff in there, uh, even just like regular just burn knives, knives and then tumbling. So a lot we, of, uh, yeah. we use big tumblers. We have a several tumblers, a lot of every, I think almost everything gets tumbled, yep. um, but there's a lot of handy burring stuff. There's stuff that, uh, yeah, it sucks maybe for the guys that work in deburr, but there's stuff that it's faster to deburr than it is for us to actually clean it up on the machine. Um, so we utilize them for that. Yeah. And or then, you just can't reach it on the machine. Or you can't reach it on the yeah. machine, that's a lot of it. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot of hand work. Uh, tumblers and then we have a whole cleaning system and everything that each part goes through and it washes the parts after they're done before it goes to coating. Um, no, honestly. Not here. Yeah, not here. Um, I would say my biggest injury is actually uh, on a lathe. And so lathes produce like longer, stringier chips if you could like picture piano wire. Um, sometimes when you're cutting like a feature that is super like tight tolerance, you'll use a sharp corner radius and they produce super small chips because you can't go that deep. And uh, they, they ball up on the tool, they ball up on the part, and a lot of the times it's smartest to use pliers to pull them off because they'll cut you. Sometimes and, you use your fingers. Yeah, sometimes you use your fingers um, on accident. Not a felon like I was asking. Like, like I did, and I went to grab a ball of chips off of a part and I had a pair of pliers and one of the piano wires snuck into oh. the grip of the plier and I didn't feel it and I just went to pull and it's cut me straight to the bone. Yeah, Yeah, I don't think here so, we really have many machining injuries. I'm yeah. like, all of us are uh, special in our own ways and like we'll like feel a cutter to see if it's sharp and like you'll, yeah. like, you'll get little cuts everything now and then but like I think besides like people not paying attention and like tripping and falling is yeah. like our biggest injury in the yeah. shop. Yeah, biggest injuries I've, I've seen are from people trying to lift stuff they shouldn't, like eight inch vices and stuff. Guys will try and throw one of those up on a table and like throw their back out or something. A lot of old yeah. people in machining. A lot of old people. Um, so forge, forge marks are li literally just a marking that the forging house puts on so that you can identify that they made it. Yep. And that's really the only difference. 
some forging houses are going to be better than others, but for one forge mark to be special from another forge mark, all it means is this this company forged that 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 piece of forging. So. Some of the forge marks that the consumer doesn't see are specific to like lot numbers because each forging gets made in a certain die, and you're going to have I don't know how many parts, say a thousand just for a round number. You're going to have a thousand parts made out of one die. You're going to have a thousand parts made out of the next die, and that gets cut off the part, the consumer doesn't ever see that number, but those are forged into the parts, and then obviously, as Justin said, it's like our A stamp on anything, it's because, you know, it came from us, it's just their logo. Yeah. I, I mean, I would say the easiest answer to that is when your part stops working. Yeah. <laughs> so when, when it things, doesn't meet print anymore. Yeah, when, when it doesn't go together and your parts and assemblies aren't going together properly, that's probably when you've exceeded your tolerance stacking is super specific part to part too like yeah. if for people that don't know tolerance stacking if you have three dimensions in a row and all three of those dimensions affect each other or affect the total fit up of the part but a lot of times if you have any dimensions like that you're gonna have an overall dimension that's going to kind of control that as well um, we don't deal with a lot of it a lot of the stuff like i said earlier is it's a lot of mil spec stuff so it's like we tighten stuff up but never in the sense of we're not going to get a part that works. It's just going to better the process. Um, it's pretty rare. Uh, a lot of our stuff is just... Well, the fine manual machine work. Yeah. How the, many times do you throw a part in, the, in a CNC and cut it yourself? Yeah, I mean... That program. Yeah, we, sometimes we put stuff like jaws in and fix the jaws in a machine that's open. And we'll write our own little program. And so it, it kind of just depends on what you define as machi manual machining. But as far as like actually putting a machine or putting a part in a machine and cutting it for like features that we sell, it's pretty rare. Maintenance or making stuff for maintenance is when most of the manual machine stuff gets utilized. We do still have several manual machines, but it's just not effective enough. Yeah, they're all they're all for we need to get this plate to put a machine in the in the in the shop or we need to put a hole in this to run cables through it. The or, tumbler. Yeah. That yeah, was a, we, we need to fix the tumbler. We had I a part mean, that was like several, it was like 13 weeks or something else. Yeah, 13 weeks. And we just had to make a, a shaft for it and a new plate for it. So we used the uh, um, the manual lathe to turn the shaft down and stuff like that because it was just quicker and the only machine in the shop we could hold that was big enough. So. Yeah. Sweet. No problem. I'm not gonna be able to walk out of here, my head's too big. <laughs>